In 1980, gender identity disorder was introduced as a diagnosis and the Tavistock's Gender Identity Service, GIDS, was set up 10 years later. In 2013, gender identity disorder was replaced with the term gender dysphoria. This change occurred in response to political pressures claiming that the term disorder was stigmatising. From as early as 2005, staff at the Tavistock Gids Clinic were expressing concerns about the use of experimental medical treatments being used on children experiencing dissatisfaction with their biological sex. Internal reports outlining the lack of research around prescription of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones were ignored. Safeguarding whistleblowers were bullied and put through disciplinary procedures. Similarly, those in the public eye who were the first to speak out were turned on by the media and ostracised by their peers. But I just kind of thought, well, once people find out that children are being uh, told that they will become, um, you know, boys are being told they will become girls if they, if they cut off their penises and, and girls are being told they will become real boys if they cut off their breasts. Uh, once they find out that the, the medical complications that come with taking cross-sex hormones like testosterone um, for, for girls, uh, you know, the side effects include osteoporosis, um, early menopause, everyone who's on testosterone, all these women who are on testosterone will go into early menopause, 30 years too early in some cases. Um, multiple sclerosis is, um, is associated with uh, men taking cross-sex hormones. So I thought, well, all you have to do <laughs> is tell people about all this and um, it will, uh, you know, it will gather momentum and people will try and stop it. But that was six years ago nearly, and uh, no one did. No one seems to care. Proper scrutiny of the Tavistock only came when a former patient, Kira Bell, brought a legal case against the clinic. Kira was prescribed puberty blockers when she was 16 and went on to have her breasts surgically removed. She later regretted going through these irreversible procedures. Like many, she came to understand her mental distress as being the result of a range of issues rather than being born in the wrong body. Kira Bell's judicial review led to the 2020 High Court ruling that under 16s were unlikely to be able to consent to puberty blockers. Subsequently, the UK government instructed esteemed paediatrician Dr. Hilary Cass to take an objective look at the Tavistock's gender services. The findings of the Cass review aligned with many of the concerns raised by whistleblowers. The evidence base for an affirmation only model was severely lacking and that the use of puberty blockers came with many risks. Following this outcome, the Tavistock Gids Clinic was closed leaving many wondering why it took the government so long to act. But on the Tavistock, they then think it's an NHS clinic full of experts. You trust them. You would think, wouldn't you? And they are told by whistleblowers as a problem, but it's an area that they feel difficulty in intervening in. Now, if that's what the Conservatives feel like, then the Labour Party, who are much more prone to embrace a lot of the diversity orthodoxies with even less thought, I don't hardly need mention the Lib Dems and the Greens, and that's kind of your political class, right? And, you know, I don't really count. I'm just like a, a, a non-affiliated, relatively new peer in the House of Lords that, let's be honest, is a bit of a maverick. So the, 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 there aren't enough mavericks in a way, and also political parties in general have become stuffed with technocrats, careerists, all sorts of, you know, there's a real collapse of uh, a political class of people with great integrity, open-minded, independent thinkers that used to exist within parties. And now that doesn't really uh, feature. And so consequently, you do get people just nodding along to things. But I think it's been a great, it's again, a great indictment of the political parties and the political le leadership of this country that allowed the Tavistock issue to continue. Just one quick final point is, I think when they started to hear about it, 
they then thought, oh my God, now we're going to get blamed. You know, can you imagine a situation where it's your worst nightmare, right? Your worst nightmare. You think you're doing the good thing and everyone will love you for it. And then some people start to imply that you have set up a medical facility that is actually institutionally offering abusive, medically abhorrent practices on children that will cause enormous psychological if indeed not physical damage. You don't want to accept responsibility. You, so you think that can't be true. It can't be true. But because you have trusted the medics, because I think that you would, it, you just want to look the other way. And I think that they just look the other way until they were absolutely forced to stare it in the eyes and stare it in the face. Mr Speaker, thank you. The CAS review interim report found that to date there's a profound lack of evidence on the best approach to treat gender dysphoria in children. Does my right honourable friend share my concern that in spite of this, the NHS insists on making a child's express gender identity the start point for treatment and also my surprise that the NHS has chosen so far not to track patient outcomes, particularly for under 18s? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I do share my honourable friend's concerns and that is why the NHS commissioned this review from one of our top paediatricians. It is already clear to me from her interim findings and for the evidence, uh, other evidence that I've seen that the NHS services in this area are too narrow, they are overly affirmative and in fact they are bordering on ideological. You know the Tavistock closed down in the UK, that was the big gender surgery performing institute in the UK. How, how was that closed, closed down? down? What happened? Government closed it down. So yeah, the because they knew that they, they figured out in the UK that, wow, the rates of transgender transformation requests were skyrocketing. And even the people at the clinic knew that they were rushing people along the transformation pipeline way faster than they should have without proper clinical evaluation. What? There's a thousand lawsuits out against the Tavistock in the UK now. Wow. A thousand. But like it's, you know, if you tell a child that it's even possible they were born in the wrong body, that is grooming because it's not true and you're planting a dangerous idea in a child's head. So I think grooming has always been the perfect word for what's going on. We're all being groomed into accepting things that we shouldn't be accepting. Another example is children's books written by so-called queer uh, creators. Um, you know, they keep slipping in uh, drawings of, of women, of young uh, people with double mastectomies. Yeah, yeah. Just the little stitches on the chest and uh, this is portrayed as the most wonderful inclusion you know and what it's actually doing is, is normalizing the idea that uh, you can find your true self through mutilation. One of the most shocking details of the Tavistock GID service was that around 80% of the children placed on a medicalized pathway were gay. Reportedly, there was a dark joke at the Tavistock that soon there will be no gay people left. And yet, such regressive and harmful ideas were being pushed by people claiming to want to promote inclusivity, care and compassion. The staff at the Tavistock seemed to be unable to question and stand up to ideologically driven external organisations such as transgender charity Mermaids, reportedly due to the fear of being labelled as bigoted. I met a young lady called Kira Bell. She was a lesbian. She was a lesbian who told me the horrific experience that she had in the Tavistock Clinic. It was an eye-opening experience. I know that the member for Kakodi and Cowden Beath talked about transing away the gay in his speech uh, in Westminster Hall debate. We are seeing, I would say, almost an epidemic of young gay children, young gay children being told that they are trans and being put on a medical pathway for irreversible decisions and they are regretting it. That is what I'm doing for, for, for young LGBT children. I am making sure, I am making sure that young people do not find themselves sterilized because they are being because they are being exploited by people who do not understand what these issues are. It seems to me as though organizations like the Race Equalities Charter and Stonewall they're almost acting like a sort of protection racket in the institutions 
um, don't want damage to their reputation. So they pay money for these organisations to come in so that they can say that they're progressive and they're anti-racist. Um, and then these organisations essentially set about you know, bullying staff and students into confessing their white fragility and all sorts. I guess I'm curious as to how a movement which seems to be about um, what well, money making, but also oppressing workers and students and infringing their rights when they don't have the power to fight back, how that can consider itself to be progressive or left wing. It seems... Well, it's the opposite. It does, seem, it does seem the opposite. And, you know, I'm from a left wing background. I think probably the word progressive, I mean, I think I probably would have always considered myself to be progressive, but now it's such a tainted term. The term left uh, wing is, is tainted as well. Increasingly, people across the political spectrum are realising the tyrannical nature of critical social justice. It's not only preventing good psychological treatments, but is often contributing to a worsening of mental health. It is unclear at this point whether the profession can survive and return to sanity. Often held up as a genius of the 20th century, Sigmund Freud's statue sits here outside the Tavistock. One can only imagine what he would make of all the harm, malpractice and lawsuits going on behind him that have left his practice of psychoanalysis hanging in the balance. In terms of the fight, I think in the UK we've kind of won already. We've kind of um, we've reversed. You know, the fact that mermaids are under statutory investigation is fantastic. The fact that Tavistock closing is fantastic. There's more um, there's more scrutiny on how we get got here, and so as a result, the kind of uh, a uh, completely incoherent set of beliefs that these people have is being exposed. There's something that remains constant for me. And the constant thing is that um, uh, the, the drive to, for healing is a universal drive. And it seems to operate across all societies and as far as we know, you know, all, all historical periods. And there's a vocation to um, offer um, succor, psychological help. Um, to people who are suffering. So no matter what happens to our professions, um, that drive to heal will still exist, but it will take new forms.